car isn't. Why not donate the old car to WGBY? We'll sell it at auction, and the proceeds will go straight towards the kinds of programs that make your kid the kind of person they are today. Learn more at WGBY.org slash car donation. Hello, guys. My name is Pancho Tomaselli. I'm a bass player, faculty member from the Community Music School of Springfield. We're very delighted to be here, and you're watching WGBY Springfield. Hadley Grass returns to the Hadley Town Common on Saturday, June 3rd in support of public television. The WGBY Asparagus Festival features fun for the whole family. Move to the music of Parsons Field, the Western Den, and other bands. Presented in partnership with Signature Sounds. Shop the festival market with local vendors and visit the Beers and Spears tent for local food and craft beer. Find the schedule of events at WGBY.org slash asparagus. Coming up next on WGBY, we'll have a live community dialogue on the opioid crisis in Western New England. The Opioid Crisis, a community dialogue, is brought to you by the contributing viewers of WGBY and by. Hello, I'm Robert Aziz, Behavior Health Manager at Health New England. We know that the opioid crisis is a serious issue that affects families and communities throughout our region. That's why we're proud to partner with WGBY to raise awareness around this critical issue. Good evening, I'm Carrie Saldo, and I'll be moderating the next hour as our panel, audience, and you at home or streaming online discuss the opioid crisis in our region during this live broadcast. Use the hashtag WGBYDialogue to send a question via Facebook or Twitter. I'll introduce our panel in a bit, but first I wanted to say that I've heard from many of you since we announced this program. Each of you has shared different impacts of the opioid crisis with me. But those different conversations, in a way, express the same belief. No one is talking about their particular perspective. And to me, that's the perfect reason to host this community dialogue. There's a lot being said about this issue, but perhaps not enough of it is heard and acted upon. With that in mind, we headed to the streets to speak with community members. We first asked them, what comes to mind when you hear the word opioid? Narcotics. Just you know, simple getaway drug. Death. Sick people. Unintended addiction. Scary. Um, could happen to anyone. It's almost like overwhelming at this point. I've seen it uh, turn people into worse versions of themselves and it's sad watching them deteriorate in front of my eyes. Deteriorate in front of my eyes. Danielle, I know that opioids is something that you struggled with and that was something that you were confronted with. You're now 11 months sober and you've joined us here this evening. I wanted to ask you, what comes to mind when you hear that word, opioid? Um, I'd have to deal with the community. I think that I have a similar perspective on it. To me, it's like suffering, loss, and pain. Hmm. So I know it's hard on everyone who has a situation with it. Yeah, and you're absolutely not alone in this struggle. We have a, a panel full of people here who are grappling with this issue, and, and sur you're surrounded by uh, people in this room as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Let me introduce the rest of our panel. Dr. Robert Roos is an expert on addic addiction with Mercy Health. He's also served on Governor Charlie Baker's Opioid Addiction Work Group. Liz Wynott is the Program Director for Tapestry Health, their needle exchange program. Jennifer Kimball is the project coordinator with the Berkshire Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative. Anthony Galuni is the Hampton County District Attorney. He also helped create the county's addiction task force. And Chantel Silloway is an adolescent recovery program director with the Goodwin House, which is a 90-day substance detox program for males ages 13 to 19. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. I'd like to come out to the room and ask a question. By a show of hands, how many of you have lost someone due to the opioid crisis? Yeah, and I think the statistics bear that out. We certainly know that. Uh, Dr. Roos, you've called addiction the greatest single public health issue facing America. Why is that? Well, it's really 
unmistakable at this point that addiction touches everybody. And when we look across the country, across into all of our states and into all of our communities, addiction, when we factor in nicotine, alcohol, and other drugs like opioids, is the leading cause of preventable death in our country. Mm -hmm. And now that we are facing a very tragic and severe opioid overdose crisis, overdose death is the leading cause of injury-related death across our country. Since 2009, it has out numbered the deaths related to motor vehicle accidents or other injury-related deaths. And for those two reasons, the magnitude as well as the tragedy associated with addiction, I believe it is the single most important issue that we face in, in regards to public health and public safety today. Hmm. And that word addiction, I'd like to come out to our audience again and ask uh, by a show of hands, who in the room considers addiction to be a disease? Quite a few of you. Anyone in the room consider addiction to be something that is a personal choice that someone has made? Anybody who's maybe in the middle of those two? So addiction, a disease. So is, is that a change from maybe what we've seen from uh, just a few years ago, how we would have looked at this issue? Well, in the medical community, there's been a lot of advances that have looked into the science of addiction. And over the last 50 years, a tremendous amount of research has really brought us to where we are today, which we know with really without a doubt that addiction is a primary chronic disease of the brain that impacts people's memory, motivation, and the sense of reward. It can impair their, it can impair their sense of control and leads to negative consequences. For a long period of time, this notion of addiction as being something solely of willpower or of choice, I think, has started to finally fade away with the increase in science that we have to back up that, as well as the innumerable stories of recovery that are a testament to how um, addiction treatment can work and how we have effective ways to intervene with this disease. But it still seems that there are some um, either stigma attached to it or certainly things that are getting in the way of people seeking that treatment. Liz, I know that um, Tapestry Health runs four needle exchanges in, in Western Massachusetts. People who are coming in, how often are you able to um, have a conversation with them that results in them agreeing to seek treatment? Well, the first thing I want to say is that thinking of the word stigma, um, we work with active injection drug users, so people that are currently using heroin. And that population, the people that are currently using, is a really hard population to access coming from an organization. In, in what way? Because they're reluctant to come in because of the fact that they're using an illegal substance? Well, it's... I think it's a novel idea that you can come into a place and you can be yourself and you don't have to worry about how someone's thinking of you and you don't have to worry about judgment. We really try to meet people where they're at. So a lot of the people that come in are not ready for treatment at that time, but we provide a lot of services and really, you know, help the person to identify ways to improve their own health and identify ways to keep themselves safe until they are ready for treatment. Um, active drug users, so, so with needle exchange, it's a really, it's shown to be really successful in accessing hard to reach populations. And I think it's just important to just focus or say that, you know, obviously active drug users are the ones that are dying from overdoses right now. And um, they're, needs to be more attention paid to that and I think more attention paid to the framework of how people view and treat people that are active in their addiction. And I think breaking down those barriers such as we try to do at Tapestry helps as part of the solution and getting people healthy and decreasing the chances of overdose and getting people into treatment. Hmm. And when you say we need to um, sort of readjust the way that we dialogue or uh, work with people who do need to seek this treatment, what would you suggest? Is it something that um, people in the community need to change their approach to people? What would you suggest? Um, well, I think even what Dr. Bruce was saying about addiction being recognized as a disease now because of all the evidence and not a moral choice or, you know, it's really out of the person's control. Like, I, I think that there has been a lot of change toward that and that we are moving in a really positive direction. But I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, an addict, um, a junkie, a heroin user, that's a stigmatizing way to refer to somebody. And I really, so what we try to do is really look at the person as an individual. And it really just boils down to care with compassion. Mm -hmm. 
and we try to teach or we, um, we try to look at everybody as an individual and really look to what they need in their life at that moment. So we try not to provide a blanket solution to people and we try to just really even involve that person in the process of of improving health, I guess, which which often and a lot of times does lead to treatment. So needle exchange is one form of treatment. I know we have some people in the audience here this evening who offer perhaps alternative treatments to the opioid um, epidemic, rather. Is there anyone here who wants to share some alternatives to using opioids that they might want to share? Thank you. My name is Alana. I'm a nurse practitioner and I'm the director of medical services at Volunteers in Medicine in Great Barrington. We have kind of looked at this from a different angle. So we're looking at the people who have chronic pain before they're using opioids to treat that pain and then getting those on the street. So we've been focusing on integrative pain management program for the past three years. We use acupuncture, massage therapy, nutrition, behavioral health. We focus on social determinants of health, so all those other factors. We have intensive intakes. We try to figure out what these people need to manage their pain, and we get them into these programs. So um, we actually took this model this past summer and worked with Berkshire Health Systems and with money from the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, we treated chronic pain patients from the community and we measured the effectiveness of using an integrative approach rather than opioids to treat their pain. Great, well thank you so much for sharing that. Chantal, let me turn to you. Um, you're working with a population ages 13 to 17. I think um, when I first heard that, I was shocked, quite frankly, that, that you're dealing with young men that young. What types of treatment are you offering these young men around the substance abuse that they're coming to you for seeking treatment for? So I'll start to say that this is a new program and we're about to open um, hopefully this coming week. But we have been working with adolescents in the past. I've been working with young ladies, which also start at a young age. And um, I think some of the thing is the accessible to being able to get opiates if it be in their medicine um, cabinets at home, if it be to get them from their friends. It's an easy way to take something that um, helps with their pain. You know, as Tylenol and ibuprofen, they figure that this is not really that, they're not getting it from the streets versus they're just getting it from their home, something that's prescribed. And many times that could be a way that they start <coughs> using opiates. So I'm, I'm hearing from you that maybe prevention could be something that we could be talking about with these these young people more often. Jennifer, I know that this is something that the the Opio Collaborate that your collaborative that you're a part of has been working on prevention specifically. Can can you talk about some of those measures that you're discussing openly around this issue? Yes, um, the Berkshire Opioid Abuse Prevention Collaborative is fortunate to have a grant from the state of Massachusetts Department of Public Health that not only works on um, primary prevention, but also on harm reduction, some of the things that um, overdose prevention that um, Liz has spoken about. Some of the prevention measures that we've decided to focus on in Berkshire County have to do around um, safe storage and safe disposal, as well as... Um, Meaning of the, of the prescription of medications? Prescription medication, safe, safe prescribing practices, using motivational interviewing techniques, um, instructing doctors to use motivational interviewing techniques to um, talk with their patients about the prescriptions that they're being given. Giving is that the to help educate the person who's being prescribed the medication or to learn a bit more about the person that they're about to prescribe this to? It's um, a little bit of, of both. I think um, people can be surprised at how little time a physician can spend with a client when they are prescribing something as major as an opioid. So it's about, it's about taking those necessary steps to have a dialogue about what your diagnosis is, what your care plan is, what your pain plan is, and steps you can take um, to um, prevent um, becoming addicted to a substance. And then from all the way from prescribing to disposal. So we have some materials around that. Um, we also provide a lot of support um, to our 
our vast amount of community partners. The collaborative is all in all 32 communities. Mm -hmm. So we have different kinds of partners that we can do um, just broad-based <laughs> education around addiction and substance use. Um, we also um, continue to support ongoing training around prescription drug monitoring program for physicians as well as pain management training, help co-sponsor and co-host um, um, scope of pain type trainings around the county for our physicians. So there's um, those kinds of prevention things that we can do. But we also are lucky to be able to work on overdose prevention as, as well. And I think that's something that we need to talk about a little bit more, the harm reduction aspect of the work that we can do around naloxone access, engagement, post overdose, and other kinds of disease prevention measures around HIV and HCV. Hmm. So we're in a unique position in, with this grant to work on primary prevention and harm reduction. Great. District Attorney, let me turn to you. When you formed the task force in this region around this issue, I believe you called it a moral obligation. I'd be curious to hear more from you about why, why you um, believed that. Well, when I came into office in early 2015, it really was an intersection of my coming into office and, and this issue really becoming more robust in Hamden County and across the county. So in developing the task force, we really wanted to bring together the various communities working on this issue and the various agencies, including law enforcement, and do our best uh, to, I think, best equip ourselves to, to deal with it, both in the criminal justice system and outside of it. And, you know, it, it, it was termed sort of a, a moral obligation from my perspective because we were seeing so many people come into the criminal justice system. And it was really th by virtue of a co kind of a co-occurrence of crime and addiction. So to not understand that and, and with the, the baseline understanding of addiction as a disease, to just continue to treat folks coming into the criminal justice system without awareness and without in a way preparing ourselves for this and trying to get them to a, to a place where um, they were dealing with the addiction as well as the, the kind of manifestation of crime that often comes with that to me didn't seem to make sense. So we tried to, to form the task force around the work we do in the criminal justice system as well as the prevention work that we do uh, before and after. Um, and that's working with young people, that's working with people who are at an age when they're, uh, you know, they're adults in, in a position to commit crimes. Uh, so we bring together health care, law enforcement, uh, grassroots organizations. It's really uh, a great coming together of all the different agencies and groups working on this issue. Uh, and I think it's better informed our work in the courthouse and it's better informed our work outside of it in terms of prevention and everything else that we're doing. When you say it's better informed that work in the courthouse, in what way, what do you mean? Well, fundamentally, it's been data. That, that's been the first piece of what we've done in the, the year or so that we've formed the task force is really a system by which we're getting real-time data of overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal, so we can understand in a very diverse county with 20, 23 cities and towns where the spikes are and then try to understand how and then provide resources, both law enforcement and otherwise, to those places that are really dealing with spikes in overdoses and, and issues that, that are obvious to us, to us through that data. But it's also just a coming together of ideas and minds working in recovery, working in the addiction communities, in the medical communities, and law enforcement, again, to better inform all of our work inside the courthouses that we do and then outside. Uh, so we're bringing together these various disciplines. Hmm. And we have a question from Twitter. Uh, the question is, how can we educate the masses on addiction being a disease instead of a choice? And I'll open this up to the audience as well if anyone wants to comment on this question. But maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Roos. Well, we've seen several great examples over the last uh, year and a half to two years of major public awareness and education campaigns that were launched as a result of Governor Baker's opioid working group's recommendations. There were major... Uh, opportunities here to really educate folks both through media campaigns as well as through direct face-to-face -face, um, educational sessions and otherwise. And so I think this really is an effort that needs all stakeholders to participate and send a similar message that addiction is a disease and not a choice. And I think when we can do that collectively together with powerful stories of recovery, we will continue to see the impact of that sort of messaging. Great. Thank you. Anyone from the audience want to add? Yes. Yes, I'm Dr. Peter Friedman. I'm an addiction medicine clinician and researcher at Bay State Medical Center and a member of the Hamden County uh, Addiction Task Force. And it's very heartening f for me as a physician to hear at the consensus that it is, in fact, a disease. 
Um, but you know, there are disease, there are diseases, and then there are diseases. And my question for the panel and for the audience is: uh, We know from the research evidence very clearly that medication treatment for opiate use disorder is the most effective way to reduce overdose and reduce overdose deaths. But still, even amongst people who acknowledge that it's a disease and in the recovery community, there are still many people who stigmatize this treatment. There are programs that refuse to accept patients who are on medication, halfway houses, et cetera. And so my question for the panel and for the audience is what can we do to sort of change the view and reduce the stigma um, that surrounds the most effective way to treat this disease? Great. Thank you. Uh, did, did I see a hand go up in the audience that you, you'd like to comment? Sure. Oh, l let me be clear. Did you want to answer, give an answer to the question or you want to add something to the discussion? Sure. Great. St. Peter. Um, I am actually an EMT in the Springfield, Western Mass area. Um, so to go on with yours as well as other ways to deal with it, um, I have personal experience. Not only do we see um, the front line of overdoses um, and Narcan use, we do have a lot of patients where we show up and if they are unresponsive, that's the first thing we go to, as well as personal. Um, I have my biological mother died three years ago of a heroin overdose, and uh, my father is currently dying because of his previous use. So going with the stigma, um, especially from a healthcare professional, I think a lot of the issue is it needs to be talked about, and it's it's not. It's spoken about, uh, you know, we can, we as a community can sit here and say that it's a disease, but words are just words. Um, and I see it a lot in the back of my ambulance when I'm talking to these people and I'm bringing them to these treatments because of all these issues that they've done. Um, I've also uh, previously worked for Behavioral Health Network, um, specifically with the Intensive Outpatient Treatment Program. Um, I don't think it's spoken about enough. And I think it's still that taboo. Um, you know, I remember when I was a kid, the D.A.R.E. programs and all of that, and it seems that those programs have gone away. You know. And also talking about the programs and the stuff that we have for families. You know, it's not just, you know, the the addiction that, you know, an individual is going through. But what about the families, uh, you know, the mothers, the fathers, the sisters, the, the wives, the husbands of people that, you know, have this opiate use is being able to train them and explain to them, you know, that addiction is a disease um, and being able to you know, kind of help them through it, but also through dual diagnosis programs, which I feel like, you know, a lot of people, when they think of, you know, that stigma of addicts, they just think about rehab and, you know, you know, being forced to go there through the courts, but also it's the dual diagnosis and, you know, what, it's the why of the what, you know, it's one thing to get clean and go through the rehab, but now let's do the, the nitty gritty work of, you know, why, what's happening, what's, what in your past got you there. And is that what you mean by dual diagnosis or can you explain that? Um, dual diagnosis programs, from what I know, and please, panel, correct me, is um, it's when someone who not only has a an, a drug addiction or an is, has a, is an alcoholic, but also they have a psychiatric issue that goes with it. So they go hand in hand. So these treatment facilities, such as the Brattleboro Retreat in Brattleboro, Vermont, focus on those where you know you're not just going through AA or NA groups. You're also going through coping skills group, and you're going through you know one on one individual therapy with an individual plan on you know if you have bipolar, if you of borderline because they're finding recently that they go hand in hand. Not everyone who has an addiction necessarily has a mental health issue, but they do, they're noticing that trend that they uh, they do go together. So again, bringing up, you know, the, how to get that stigma away is not just speaking it as, mm -hmm. you know, addiction and mental health, but they're humans. Everyone's humans. And I feel like as a community, sometimes we forget that because if it's not touching us at home, then we don't want anything to do with it. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel, Liz, do you want to comment to, you know, to the gentleman's point about roadblocks to getting these types of medication-based treatments? Is it something that you're seeing in your line of work? Yes, we, we see that a lot. Um, and I, I'm thinking even 10 years ago, I can't, I don't know of any treatment program that you could get into when, if you were on methadone 10 or 15 years ago. So again, I think a lot of progress has been made, but um, I, I think that 
the evidence clearly shows, again, that medication-assisted treatment is one of the most effective ways to reduce opioid deaths and to help people stay on treatment. But I think a lot of it is the the way what we believe in what our own experiences and how that has formed into what our opinions are of the issue. And I think it's really important for, our, for us as a collective to really look at the evidence and see what has been shown to be effective and be, have that to be a leading way of where substance use treatment can go. So what are some ways we can help the community think about this? Because as I mentioned in my open, as we discussed the fact that I was going to be helping host this program, people are reaching out to me. And one of the things that I've heard from people, um, there's a methadone, uh, there's a there's a methadone clinic in downtown Pittsfield. And in the morning, people have said to me, there's a line outside the door of people who look like they're, they're struggling. I wouldn't want to walk my children past them on the way to school, things like this. So what can we say as, as a community? What can we help the broader community to understand around this perhaps? Or I mean, there, there are people who I think would say very plainly, I'm going to take a different way to work or I'm going to take a different way to school for my kids because they're they're scared. They're they're afraid for their children or they're afraid for their safety based on what they see. What might you say to them? Um, I would say to them that um, a person is here, clearly here struggling, but they're doing their best they can to get off of the drugs and moving on to the methadone or the um, Suboxone or even the Vivitrol. And that's not just a crutch for them. It's something that people will be on it for years because it helps them lead productive lives and um, be good parents and children to their families. Um, and also, just because you're an addict does not make you a criminal, um, which is important. I know people stigmatize that a lot. So, mm. Do you mind my asking, is, is medication something that in your course of treatment that you've found helpful or useful? Or um, have you had a different I have path? been on Suboxone in the past, and it was helpful for a long time. And um, at one point, it was just I decided it was uh, my time to get off of it. And you were able to transition, and now you have a different treatment, uh, different treatment plan. Um, so right now, I'm not on any medicated assistant treatments, and um, I haven't been since um, January 2016. Congratulations. Thank you. And we have another question from Twitter. Um, the question is: Education is key, but what other addiction resources are offered in Western Massachusetts? Anyone in the audience want to respond to that? I'll start there, and before I go to the panel, oh, the hand here. My, excuse me, my name is Elena Wand. Medically assisted, uh, uh, medical assistance in addiction is really important, and like you said, it's do less harm. But addiction is a spiritual, uh, it's a physical, spiritual, emotional disease, and it has to be treated in many, from many different directions. So to just take a substitute for a certain amount of time doesn't usually bring people out of the addiction that they're, the way their lives have evolved through that addiction and that that's where programs come in and um, counseling and AA and NA are necessary to get you, to change you, to cha so that you can learn how to live a life. When you're addicted, especially for a certain amount of time, your life takes a certain direction and certain things happen to you that you have to come back from, things that you have to build again if you've lost them. And we usually can't do that on our own. We usually need assistance. We need help of each other. And that's why a lot of the new peer-directed programs like uh, recovery coaches and things like that are becoming more and more important. Mm -hmm. And that's why also with what I do, I have um, sober houses. So that community that they come into and live with people, six or eight other people doing the same thing that they're doing, getting jobs, going to AA, uh, being on um, uh, methadone or suboxone if they need it at that time, um, it's, it's a it's a it's a whole community because it's not just that person. It's their children. It's their family. It's everybody involved in their recovery. And we have to come together as a community and help the, help these people. And I don't use, I don't like to use the word um, uh, substance abuser anymore. They have a substance use disorder. And it puts a different view on, on what we're doing today. And there's so many different pieces of this that we just can't look at one piece. And some people, when they're on methadone for a certain amount of time, you have to, there has to be more than just 
methadone or suboxone or Vivitrol. And um, I find that people that have a combined group of services are much more successful than people that go just in one direction. So we've heard a few times, oh, uh, sure, come on up. My name is Annie and I'm in long-term recovery, which means I haven't had a drink or a drug in 35 years. Um, Previous to the job that I have now, I ran a Suboxone clinic. To the person that's afraid of the people in line, you need to be a pay, afraid of the people that aren't in the line. Um, that's, that's the first thing. Um, and I think it's an opportunity to teach your children about compassion um, and loving kindness. Um, I also, you know, uh, Dr. Roos was also in a documentary called The Fix, and in that, um, they didn't call it medicated assisted treatment. They called it medicated assisted recovery. And in fact, they called it medicated assisted recovery services. And the, the, you walked in and it looked like welcome to Mars. And, uh, I think that, that taking the stigma out of medicated assistance is something, you know, it's, it's, it's like being gay that, that people can internalize homophobia. The people in recovery have internalized the stigma that we've heard all our lives. And so we turn it against each other. And I think that we just, you know, there are multiple pathways, not to recovery, of recovery. And we need to embrace all of them. I think a few times now we've heard these words Suboxone and Vivitrol. So can we talk a little bit about what these medications are and the function that they serve for people who are in recovery? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I want to echo Dr. Friedman's point. The use, the use of medication-assisted therapy in the treatment of opioid use disorder is by far the gold standard and that has the highest quality of evidence to reduce both illicit use, reduce the transmission of infectious diseases, and reduce overdose and overdose deaths. The use of medication, to, to Elaine's point, is in combination with other services that attend to the biopsychosocial needs of that person. And that's important to understand that these medications have been used in very structured ways and with other treatment elements that have led to their success in many ways. So methadone is a long-acting opioid agonist that is used to prevent withdrawal, prevent cravings, and help somebody get that structure and reform and recover the other aspects of their life that they need to continue working on. Will they be able to stop taking that in some point in their lives, or is it something that will be a part of, of how they exist for, forever? Well, it's really an individualized decision between the individual and their provider team, and the idea is that people continue treatment for chronic diseases as long as they need it to prevent relapse of that disease. One of the things that can bring up stigma, to kind of bring that point into this as well, is that with diseases that impair people's behaviors, when the disease is out of control, it often is very visible to other people in society, which is not the case with many other chronic illnesses. For example, if individuals with diabetes or hypertension don't take their medication and their disease becomes uncontrolled, nobody really notices it unless they end up in the emergency room, and then the emergency department notices it. But people with substance use disorders or mental health disorders, if they aren't attending to treatment that attends to the needs that they have, people often notice because they're impacted and they have a very visible presentation that can, that can, that can lead, ultimately lead to people creating some false sense of judgment, as I would see it. So, so medications like methadone or buprenorphine, which is the medication in Suboxone, can be continued indefinitely if that is appropriate, or they can be tapered off if appropriate and enter into um, continued monitoring and other ways to attend to their recovery. Mm. So that's one form of treatment. Um, I had a very robust conversation with a father who stopped me when he found out that this program was happening. And um, he explained to me that one, his son died last year. He had struggled with an opioid problem for a large portion of his life, and his son was 32 when he passed away. And what the father expressed to me was you know, sadness and grief, but also frustration because he felt like there was nothing he could do to help this adult child of his get treatment. And so what he asked me was, what is it that I can do? And I, I thought of perhaps a Section 35 uh, civil commitment or perhaps a Rogers hearing. I mean, but those are, are pretty... Um, sort of harsh approaches to this, but uh, maybe, I know this isn't exactly your area of law, <laughs> DA Glooney, but could you maybe speak to those two things and, and uh, offer them up as, as potential solutions for this gentleman, if they are? Sure. Uh, those are both civil statutes in Massachusetts, but a Section 35 hearing would probably be 
uh, a, a mechanism in the array of options for somebody who's really in, in a very difficult spot, a family member who's frustrated in the essential, um, the essential, the, uh, the principle of the sec Section 35 hearing is that the person has to be a danger to himself or herself or the community. And a judge will make a decision. It's a, a filing in, in the court, in the district court, anywhere in Massachusetts. And there's a presentation made by a family member, a medical provider, and so forth. There has to be some sort of relationship between the person who's the subject of the petition and the petitioner. And then by a clear and convincing evidence standard, a judge will make a decision as to whether that person uh, is in those, that, that condition where uh, he or she is a danger to himself or herself or the community, and that can result in up to a 90-day period, really, of incarceration, but it's typically in a state hospital, hospital facility where that person is first and foremost cared for and put in a position where he is no longer a, a threat to himself or anybody else. And does the judge dictate whether or not they will complete that full 90 days, or can a person choose to sign themselves out, say, after two days? No, that, that's going to be up to the judge, and then I think there's a consultation with the petitioner as well. There's typically rehearings where that's, that's determined as, as time goes on, but it, the, the statute does allow for 90 days for that person to be held uh, if that if that condition, so to speak, persists. And how about a Rogers hearing? A Rogers hearing, in my understanding, doesn't have the same applicability. It typically deals with mental health disorders. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's in some way uh, a, a different from uh, an, a Section 35 hearing in that it's typically brought by a medical care provider that requires the subject of the Rogers hearing to take a regimen of medication. But uh, in my uh, experience or research, it's typically only applied with mental health disorders. And are these effective uh, methods of perhaps getting someone help if, if the person who is struggling isn't in a place to be ready to say, okay, I'm ready to seek treatment? Well, I think that many of us that have been treating individuals with substance use disorders for a long time will certainly have um, examples of individuals who have access care through the execution of a Section 35 or a civil commitment as, as an entree into treatment that then led to further care. So I think there are examples of where that can be helpful. However, the evidence would suggest that um, treatment is much more successful when it is voluntarily um, entered by the individual and then you know, you're allowed to engage with them and enhance their motivation to continue treatment sort of on their own accord. Is there, are there things that we can do as a community to maybe encourage someone to take that step? Or Danielle, I mean, for you, at, at some point, I know we, we've discussed that you made that decision for yourself. Can, can you talk about the moment that you knew that treatment was, it was time for treatment for you? Um, for me, it was the threat of my son not being able to come back into my life. And he's two, right? Yeah, he's two years old. Um, thankfully, he was with my parents. Um, however, of course, any mother wants to raise their child, and I didn't want to pass up on that opportunity that every mother deserves. Um, so yes, he got me into treatment, but there comes a point where you have to start doing it for yourself. Um, so yes, Travis got me there, but um, I continue on doing it for me because I'm genuinely happy now, and I don't have to use drugs or alcohol to find that happiness anymore. And your, your particular treatment facility allows you to have Travis with you, is that right? Yeah, um, so it's the Grace House in Northampton, and um, it's for mothers with children. It's through an IHR, which is the Institute of Health and Recovery. Um, so, yeah, I've been there since last August, and it's, it's done me wonders. Terrific. We have another question from Twitter. Uh, Jen on Twitter asks, what are the panel's opinion on the increasing use of fentanyl test strips to prevent overdose, and are they helpful or just a Band-Aid? Liz, you're smiling. Why don't I start with you? Well, yeah, I mean, this, this was, um, it's very helpful. And so it's, it's kind of a, I think also another approach to helping to prevent an overdose. So there's been a lot of newer discussion recently around using fentanyl test strips, which are um, normally used to test someone's urine for traces of fentanyl, but instead being used to test the drug that they're using to see if the presence, if there is a presence of fentanyl. So just um, using that, and, and if there, it is positive for fentanyl, that helps to, that informs the user of 
that they, they, they'll need to use less, basically, if there is, because fentanyl is in, much more potent than heroin. It's also something that I, I really like that perspective on the issue, and I think it's also another thing that can empower the person that's struggling with addiction to make a choice or, you know, just have another tool that can help to prevent overdose and prevent a death. And, um, I, I, yeah, I just think it's very empowering. Anyone else from the audience want to comment on that? Before I head back to the computer, we have another Twitter question. Okay, great. So the question from a person on Twitter says, how can the spiritual communities be involved with healing and helping people to come together? Any thoughts? No thoughts? I can make a comment on that. Okay. I think that um, there's many uh, spiritual recovery programs out there that we need to get to know, such as Celebrate Recovery. I know that Hope um, for Holyoke offers that in a non-traditional way. It's not held in a church, but there are some local churches in the area that do help that. And I think it's part of the healing process when you not only focus on just their physical well-being, but their emotional and spiritual well-being brings that holistic approach where healing starts because they really need to think about their whole being. And when a spiritual community sees it, that they don't just focus just on the spiritual aspect, but the whole person. And um, it gives value to, hopefully, to that individual person that someone cares in the community, that they really genuinely care for them. As someone else was saying prior in the audience, is that's the most important thing is that people uh, would care. For myself, um, I think that that's probably been the greatest thing for myself is faith and spiritual well-being to be able to um, see people in a way that have the perspective to say that per every person, you know, should be cared for. And having the opportunity to work with a young lady that was in um, the Griswold Center about 12 years ago. And um, I met her through a coworker at CHD, and um, I was her peer, prayer support person in the community and had the opportunity to go to the Griswold, and she didn't even know me, and the, she called me her prayer lady. She still calls me her prayer lady uh, 12 years later, <laughs> and uh, I'm thankful that she's still around. And every day that she knows that she can call and just know that someone's out there caring for her. Hmm. And um, I think that that's, you know, everyone should have a prayer lady or a prayer <laughs> gentleman in their lives. And um, I think that that really brings healing to someone that they know. I didn't even know this lady except I knew her name. And uh, we've built that relationship 12 years now. Hmm. That's wonderful. Can I also just quickly add I'm sure. sorry. I, I, um, I like the saying the opposite of addiction is connection and I think that's a really important part when thinking about how spirituality and faith based can help with overcoming addiction because um, the the act of connecting with people around you and having a really positive community I guess is, is something also to consider. Yeah. I'd also like to comment on a very easy nuts and bolts way that a faith community can connect with people, host a meeting, um, I'm fortunate also to work with a group called the Central County RX Heroin Work Group, which is around the Central County towns in Berkshire County. And we were very fortunate to have Trinity Episcopalian Church um, offer to host for free one of our meetings last month, provide coffee, provide beverages, offer it up to the people in Lenox, but also in their community, the other pastors, priests, and clergy in Berkshire County to host a meeting about naloxone and to talk about naloxone and the importance of even clergy getting trained. That is a fantastic, really nuts and bolts, concrete way to open a door to a lot of conversation. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about naloxone and how it would be used? Um, I think that many of us are realizing, um, no matter what walk of life we're in, um, that this crisis is touching all of us. And frequently, um, churches and other kinds of areas are considered safe spaces for people. Sometimes their doors are open if they're running a pantry program or anything like that. And there are clergy members who feel that... Um, they don't know who's driving the kids up to Sunday school. They don't know who has a problem. They need to be prepared to save somebody's life, that it is all of us, that it does walk among us. 
and that um, they just feel that it's a very empowering and destigmatizing thing for them to be trained on naloxone and maybe they can open up conversations with people in their community and in their congregations who may have problems who maybe haven't talked about it before. But naloxone, this is a drug that would be administered in um, if someone were overdosing on an opiate, is that yep. correct? That's yep. right. Naloxone is an opioid antagonist or an opioid blocker that would be administered during an overdose to reverse those effects and ultimately in many cases, as our first responders know here, save someone's life who could potentially otherwise die from respiratory depression. Great. We have another question on Twitter. So Wendy on Twitter asks, what do young people need to prevent, what do young people need to do to prevent opioid addiction? And what's the role of primary prevention? I'd like to speak to that, Carrie, because uh, I don't think there's any uh, prescription for how we can inform our young people, but I, I think the best thing we can do is provide them with awareness. And through our addiction task force here in Hamden County, we developed a video. It's about a half hour long in which Dr. Roos is featured and many other people where we present stories of addiction and ultimately recovery as well. So it's, it's really a hopeful piece. And uh, my office's intention as we've begun is to show this to high school audiences across the county systematically. And I think it presents, um, uh, in some ways, uh, a very stark reality. And it presents, which I think is very important about the piece, the different pathways to addiction. And whether it starts with prescription drugs and a, a lawful, appropriately prescribed drug for you know, some sort of illness or injury, uh, and also uh, people who started with illicit drugs, recreationally and so forth, that build to an addiction, but also talks about those different pathways to recovery as well. Uh, so uh, I, my objective is to just breed awareness in young people, also in parents, to understand the signs of maybe uh, illicit drug use or otherwise. So information is really key. And I think uh, the more we can provide young people in particular with awareness at this stage, I think the better off we'll be in the years to come, two, four, six years down the road, when the understanding is better and hopefully prevention works and we're uh, you know, working away from the problem we find ourselves in right now. Absolutely, what are some of those signs that people should be aware of in, in their young children that they're, they should be looking for? I think it can be any number of things. Uh, I, I think most simply it's looking for signs of drug use, whether it's looking in, in their bedrooms at home for things like needle caps or cotton balls or burned spoons, things that seem inconsistent with what you know about your son or daughter. Uh, and it's also being very observant about the people with whom your children are spending time and looking at their behaviors as well, looking at the behaviors, of course, of, of the child. And, and, and if you see dramatic changes in personality or behavior or energy levels, anything that might be alarming or just seem odd to you, and I think that is it should be enough to initiate at least a conversation and further investigation. But uh, we did uh, uh, really an exhibit at the Holyoke Mall here in Hamden County where it was uh, uh, kind of a mock-up of a child's bedroom. And we put in that bedroom things that might be signs of drug use or things at least to be concerned about. And we had, of course, educational materials there as well and people to walk parents through and say, here's what you want to look for. And the essential point was, the fundamental point was, just be aware, be vigilant. And if you see something that's concerning, you see something that you've learned about here today or you've seen on TV as maybe an indicator of drug use, have the conversation, get in front of it before it might be too late and addiction has taken hold. Better to have the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, just have you come over to the mic. I, I, what I would add to that around primary prevention is that we need to do a lot better job of uh, the medical profession, which uh, Dr. Roost and I are, are proud members, we need to do more around talking to patients for whom we're prescribing opioids around how to keep them safe, so using uh, lock boxes, um, uh, and especially, I think, uh, and especially uh, giving short duration of treatment, so the minimum amount that's needed to treat the pain that's severe enough to warrant an opioid. So like if you have your tooth pulled, you really only need like one day of opioid. After that, ibuprofen should be fine, right? Or, you know, you can think of any other acute thing that happens just to limit the, the amount that's out there on, um, in the community. And then it's to educate people about safe disposal. So I have a question for the audience. Can I ask a question? Please. 
uh, honest question. How many of you have an opioid in your medicine cabinet? Okay. Just for a rainy day. A couple. A couple. So, you know, there are people who um, – uh, you're, you don't know who your kids are spending time with, who's coming through your house. We certainly hear about people who go to open houses, real estate open houses, and say they need to use the bathroom to go and look through medicine cabinets and stuff to find opioids. So this, you know, 80% uh, of the uh, prescription opioids that people misuse um, come in some way, shape, or form from a legitimate prescription. Um, so if you're on an opiate yourself, yourself you need to keep, chronically, you need to keep them safe, use a lockbox. And if you receive them and the course, of, you know, your tooth was pulled or you broke your leg or whatever and the course of treatment is done, you need to dispose of them safely. Um, and, and a way to do that, I know that um, there are a lot of police departments that will accept these medications. Do you know of other areas? There are, dr there are police departments um, and some hospitals that will accept them back. Um, the recommendation currently is to uh, put them in with, co with coffee grounds or kitty litter. But frankly, as kind of, if, if you don't have that, I, I, this is controversial, but I tell people if you don't have any of that and you can't get access, you should just flush them because it's certainly, yeah, even though I've it's. I've heard so many times that that's something you shouldn't they be They recommend, because people are concerned about the water supply and whether it will get into the water table. But the fact of the matter is we really have a crisis, and if you just don't have these other means to dispose of it, I think the disposal really is the, is the key thing that people need to worry about. Let me Not ask you some hypothetical concern about opioids in the water. I mean, sure. um, I heard from a chronic pain sufferer who said that she no longer has access to her medication because she's refused to sign um, the the contract that she's been given when she goes into a medical provider's office. Mm -hmm. And she said her problem with this now is she's a chronic pain sufferer and she feels like she is now being victimized in as part of this opioid crisis. What recommendations you would give to her or others like her? Yeah, well, I think if people if people are receiving opioids for legitimate purposes, um, th there has been a lot of tightening around the way we do this. Um, I think what I would say to her is the fact that your doctor wants you to do an opioid agreement, wants you to do more urine testing, wants you to come and do pill counts, those are ways to keep yourself and your family safe and the community. And these are things that doctors have not been doing enough of, and this is sort of why we have this problem in the first place. So I would say, as a citizen, um, it's yeah, it's a little bit of a ha it's a hassle for her to have she to come said in. For her specifically, in the age of, of medical records being hacked pretty consistently, mm -hmm. she's very concerned with the stigma, especially apparently in this one document there was a clause that said she had to agree to not resell these drugs, and she did not like the implication that that made her feel like she was a drug dealer. Are, are these are these documents too invasive? Well, again, there are agreements that you will not do that, so you're saying that you are not going to do that. I mean, there are a lot of things that we consent to when we go for treatment. Um, this is part now of what we need to do in order to keep the community safe. And what I would say to her is, uh, and I hopefully her doctor has said this to her, this is, this is a routine thing that we're doing now with all patients who are on chronic opioids. Um, uh, and if your doctor is not doing it and you're on chronic opioids, you should ask her or him why they're not doing it because that really is the best way to keep everybody safe. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> oh, Heather. Hi. Again, um, I'm a woman in long-term recovery, and um, I had the privilege of working for Dr. Roos at Providence Detox. I've also worked for BHN's My Sister's House, the Opportunity House, and the Hope Center, and um, Phoenix House. We talked a lot tonight about um, opiates that are coming from doctors, but my experience was that more of our young people are coming to us with opiates from the streets, and they're kids. And they, are str they start using drugs, and they don't understand that they're, before they know it, they're going to be strung out. And, you know, you start using recreationally, and then you wind up strung out. And they come from families, with, and they're coming out of that environment. And that crisis has been around for a really long time. So 
more recently, I found more people coming through detox to get off of opiates that were prescribed. But the, in general, right, Dr. Roos, a lot of those people coming through are not coming through that way. A lot of our young people that are coming in at 20 and 22 and 25 have been using drugs on the street since they're 13. And um, we don't have enough treatment in Springfield for our addicts. We don't have enough programs. We don't have enough detoxes. We don't have enough aftercare. It's just not available. I know that when I worked for Dr. Roos and I was in detox and I had to try to place somebody after their seven or ten or five days in detox, I had no beds to send them to and I had to send them back out into the street. There's no continuum of care in Springfield. We don't have like ad care in Worcester where, well, you have a little bit more of it now in Providence, huh? Mm -hmm. We're building it. Yeah, that's right. We're <laughs> on. I'm just going to have to let you know we're coming close to the okay. end of our show. But anyway, so it's not <laughs> only prescribed opiates. We have to, we've got family crises out there that we have to deal with and children that are in the streets, and that's where they're being raised. So we have a bigger problem than just prescribed opiates. You know, it's a community problem. And we have about a minute and a half left in our show, so I just want to turn back to the panel very quickly. If someone's watching the show and they're concerned and they want to get treatment for someone, what would you, where would you direct them? Well, there's a number of resources in our community that are available for people that are seeking help. Certainly you can call Mercy Behavioral Health Care, which has a range of a continuum of care for addiction services, which includes both inpatient detoxification or a medically supervised withdrawal program, a stabilization service, and a range of outpatient services. So you could call Providence Hospital directly at 536-5111. There is also a statewide helpline that anyone can access, which is a 1-800 number that provides access for folks that either need education or need referrals or resources for treatment. Great. Well, terrific. That's all the time we have tonight. The WGBY website has links to resources in the region related to this issue. Head to wgby.org slash resources. On behalf of the Center for Human Development, the Berkshire Eagle, and WGBY, thank you to our panelists, the audience here in the Springfield studio, and you, our viewers. Thanks for watching. I'm Carrie Saldo. Have a wonderful evening. The Opioid Crisis, a community dialogue, is brought to you by the contributing viewers of WGBY and by. Hello, I'm Robert Azies, Behavioral Health Manager at Health New England. We know that the opioid crisis is a serious issue that affects families and communities throughout our region. That's why we're proud to partner with WGBY to raise awareness around this critical issue. On Masterpiece. Huh? We have permission to search your property. One of my young airmen has gone missing. What? You wanted to serve your country. Not at the expense of everything else. If you're going to marry Nick, be certain that you can make him happy. Home Fires on Masterpiece.